business. Okay, so what we were discussing last time was that after you take the entropy inequality, multiply it with the temp absolute temperature theta, and eliminate the radiation term R, then you get what is called a reduced entropy inequality. So this is what we get, and this is called reduced entropy inequality. Now for us, entropy inequality is equivalent to the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy inequality is equivalent to the second law of thermodynamics. So if we substitute, now this is the definition, like Helmholtz free energy. We define Helmholtz free energy phi as E minus theta eta, theta eta. So phi is, again, Helmholtz free energy per unit mass. And we differentiate both sides with respect to time using the chain rule of calculus. So we get phi dot. And then the underlined, the two underlined terms, E dot minus theta eta dot, they appear here also. So we can substitute for E dot minus theta eta dot in terms of phi dot. And that's what we get. So this is again basically a still reduced entropy inequality, except it is in terms of the Helmholtz free energy. And Helmholtz free energy will play a role, as you will see um, either today, if not today, certainly tomorrow. So it's not that we are wasting your time. Helmholtz free energy is important. And from like tomorrow onwards, when we define an elastic material, which we have not defined yet, you will see that the Helmholtz free energy is critical. Like it plays, it basically defines the material. Okay, so, so I'm rewriting this one again, no, no change, except the sign has been changed, like everything has been multiplied with minus one, and therefore this greater than or equal to becomes less than or equal to, so that's the reduced entropy inequality. Now, if we have a rigid body, in a rigid body, there is no strain rate. So dij is 0. Therefore, this term vanishes. A rigid body does have entropy. Its temperature can change. It has internal energy. The only thing is it cannot deform. So there is nothing, there is no, inter, no energy that you can store in it because of mechanical deformations. But you can change its energy because of temperature change. So now we consider a case when there is no rate of change of anything. That means these terms vanish. And what we get then is that the entropy inequality implies qi theta comma i over theta is less than or equal to 0. And as one of you said, that means the angle between the heat flux q and the temperature gradient theta comma i must be more than 90 degrees. Now, if we follow the Fourier's law, which means qi is minus kappa or k theta comma i. So if we assume Fourier's law of heat conduction, which says that qi is minus kappa or k theta comma i. So if substitute that in here, what do we get? We get kappa theta comma i, theta comma i over theta. Now this thing should be greater than or equal to 0. Because that minus sign, I have canceled it. So this minus sign will appear here. And since I am multiplying by minus 1, I will change the sign of the inequality. So what does it imply? So theta comma i, theta comma i, that's the magnitude of the temperature gradient, square. Can the magnitude of a vector be negative? 
the magnitude of a vector cannot be negative and it cannot be zero unless the vector itself is zero. The absolute temperature is not negative by definition. So what it implies is that the thermal conductivity must be greater than or equal to zero. So the reduced entropy inequality tells us or it requires that thermal conductivity of a body must be non-negative. It doesn't say it, is, it must be positive, but it says it cannot be negative. And that, from experience, we know that, that thermal conductivity cannot be negative. However, it's good to see that the thermodynamics we are studying or the second law of thermodynamics requires that, or it gives you that. It's an outcome of that. Okay, now, the next step was, the, the next thing we studied was the following. So we have studied so far, I think one of you told me correctly, we have studied so far balance loss, and that has been like balance of mass, linear momentum, moment of momentum energy either internal energy or total energy one of the two not both so let's say internal energy and entropy inequality so that's not quite a balance that is imbalance Okay, so we have studied during the last three, four weeks, balance of mass, linear momentum, moment of momentum, and internal energy, and we just finished entropy inequality. Now in continuum mechanics, a body can deform only if these balance laws, these four balance laws are satisfied. So a solution of these balance laws is called a thermodynamic process. A solution, remember all of these four laws, they are partial differential equations. We don't have a closed system yet. Closed means the number of equations does not equal the number of unknowns. The number of equations does not equal the number of unknowns. However, if by some magic, and at this time it is magic because number of equations does not equal the number of unknowns. So if we can find a solution of these four equations, what else will we need to find a solution? I think already you, you already have answered that question. What else do we need to solve these four equations? Yeah, I hear somebody saying constitutive equation, but that is not, we have not studied that yet. But this thing you have studied before. Yes? Initial and boundary, Initial and boundary conditions. So a solution of these equations a solution of these equations under the given initial and boundary conditions is called a thermodynamic process. So we are assuming that we can solve these equations subject to the given initial and boundary conditions, and therefore we have a thermodynamic process. Now every thermodynamic process must satisfy entropy inequality. It must satisfy the so-called second law of thermodynamics, which means in our case entropy inequality. 
So if we have a static problem, so if we have a static problem, so we don't need initial conditions because the problem is in equilibrium. The body is in equilibrium all the time. Now, of course, you can say, uh, why, how will it deform? And that really means you are doing, you are deforming the body so slowly that inertia forces do not play any role. And I don't see flat here, but if he's doing strain, uh, tension test at a strain rate of 10 to the minus 4 per second, which is very slow. I mean, if you want to deform the body by a strain of 1, it will take 10 to the power of 4 seconds, which is a long time. Yeah. So, so static means that we are deforming it very slowly. In that case, you don't need initial condition. So you need only boundary conditions. And there are two types of boundary conditions. So, so the boundary conditions we need for a mechanical problem For a mechanical problem, either you can prescribe displacements. So either we can prescribe displacements, U, or surface tractions, so either we have U equal to U bar at a point, or we have Tn equal to F bar at a point. The the quantities with a superscript, sorry, the quantities with an over bar, this U bar and F bar, they are given. Like in the pressure vessel problem, that's an example in the book. Some of, one of you wrote to me. Um, I think one of you had a question about how to solve the problem, I don't know, number three or four in the assignment. Like how to find surface traction on a plane. So the main difficulty there is to find the unit normal to a plane. And I think all of, most of you know how to find a unit normal to a plane. So this N here is the normal uh, to, the, to the boundary. So if, if this is omega, and this is the outward normal N, F bar the pressure, or the surface traction, if it is pure pressure, then it is along the normal. But if there is both normal and tangential component, then F bar and N do not coincide. They are not along the same line. So either we are given F bar, or we are given displacement U bar. So if, if F bar is given on the entire boundary, So if F bar is prescribed on the entire boundary, then the problem is traction value. Traction value because surface tractions are given at every point on the body, on the surface of the body. And the pressure vessel that you studied is a typical example of that. Because you are given pressure on the inner surface as well as pressure on the outer surface. You were not given displacements at any point, and you found stresses. <coughs> However, if you want to find displacements in a pressure vessel, then you need displacements at some point. Otherwise, you cannot find uniquely. If U bar is given at on the entire boundary, so if U bar is given on the entire boundary, then the problem is displacement value.
So we can have either a traction value problem or a displacement value problem. And what is the third possibility? Mixed. When we can have displacements given at some points and tractions given at other points, or, or if you consider a possible situation like this, so I have a flat, smooth surface, and I, this is my omega, say omega zero, undef undeformed state. So on this surface, if I apply loads to it, so what is the boundary condition on this surface, the, the contact surface? And assume that this part here, if there is something called rigid, assume it is rigid and it is rest at rest. So it's rigid and stationary. And this stationary is with an A, not with an E. It's at rest. Oh, there's a stationary with an E also. Right? OK, so what will be the boundary condition on, on this surface? Assume that this rigid body is smooth. Zero yes? Zero displacement. Oh, but you need to press that. Uh, zero displacement at the boundary. Zero displacement. How many of you agree with him? At least you got company, one, two, three, four, five, six. Anybody at Wake Forest? Do you do all of you agree with him? It depends on the direction of the displacement. Very good. So which component of displacement is zero? Uh, vertical, vertical component is zero. Yeah, the vertical component of displacement is zero. And since the body is smooth, what else can we say? If you are driving on ice, what will happen? What happens to your tires? Not, you, not your tires of your car. Or if you are walking on ice, what happens uh, with ride? That's because tangential traction is zero. So the, that's why I put their smooth body. So what we then what we have is at each point on this surface, the normal component of displacement is zero, and the tangential traction is zero. Okay. So it's a again kind of mixed boundary value problem. Except at each point now, we have a we have normal component of displacement is zero, and tangential traction is zero. You cannot. Not, 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 and O. You cannot be given normal component of displacement and normal component of traction at the same point. You cannot be given tangential component of displacement and tangential component of traction at the same point. At a point, displacements and tractions have to be linearly independent. You cannot say, oh, well, this body cannot move down because this, the lower one is rigid, and I will apply only normal pressure of one PSI. That's not your choice. That has to be determined as a part of the solution of the problem. So these contact problems are tricky in that sense. So now the next question is, are the, do we or should we expect a unique solution of the problem? Should we expect one solution of the problem? And the answer is no, because if you take a traction value problem that I mentioned last time or yesterday, so if you take a traction value problem, which is like a half ball, and you can say the inner surface, this point is A, and the outer surface, the point is B, you can turn it inside out. Okay, before we do that, what are the surface tractions on, this, uh, on, the, on the boundaries of the body? Surface tractions. So what are the loads acting? 
zero. We are neglecting atmospheric pressure. Okay, we don't consider the atmospheric pressure to be significant in this problem. So there are no tractions acting. So it's a traction value problem. But there are null, null, tractions are null, zero. So I invert it inside out. And now B becomes A and A, B goes to A and A goes to B. And what are the surface tractions acting on it? Zero. Okay. So if if I am if my equations are correct, if the four balance laws we wrote down, if they are correct, we must get two solutions of this problem. Otherwise, our theory is garbage, and we have wasted our 15 weeks or 14 weeks, and you can ask for a refund of your tuition. Because whatever I taught you doesn't work. Okay. Now, fortunately, there are two solutions. So you cannot ask for the refund. Now, the next thing looks magical, and that's the following. It looks magical because we are not used to thinking this way. Now, I'm doing a simple tension test. However, the loads we apply are such that at point A, the load must be always to the left. At point B, it must always be to the right. That's the constraint. So you have basically, you have put buckets here, and they are, you are putting water in them. So the, so the load is always to the right at point B, and is to the left at point A. And you will expect that the bar will stretch. Okay. However, the theory says it can it can not only stretch but it can compress also. Why? Why are you surprised? Look, surface traction is still in the same direction at point B is still to the left, so still to the right, my right, your left, and here it is still at point A. The condition was it must be to the left, my left, so it is still to the left. And that's the boundary condition, right? And there are no loads applied on these surfaces, and there are no loads applied on these surfaces here. So we must have two solutions. One corresponds to tension of the bar, and the other corresponds to compression of the bar. Now, those of you who do experiments are scratching your heads. What is this guy teaching? I never saw this thing in experiments, which is probably true. However, you did not apply dead loads to the body either. I mean, you did not apply loads so that at point B, the traction is always to the right, and at point A, it is always to the left. You are applying displacements. Okay. Now, then you might say, okay, a displacement control test will always give me a unique solution. The answer is no. It will not give you, it may not give you a unique solution. And the, the example is the following. I think most of you, or I should not say most of you, some of you probably have heard something like Kuwait in, in, fluid, in fluid mechanics class. You probably have heard something like Kuwait flow. How many of you are familiar with this name? This is name of a person. Anyway, if you are not, so it doesn't matter. So let's, this experiment goes something like this. You take in a rod. It's a solid rod. Assume it's made of, it's um, rigid. And this is in a big cylinder. And let's fill this thing up. Fill the gap between the two. Generally, in fluid mechanics, you fill it up with the Navier-Stokes fluid. <clears throat> but in since we are not necessarily talking about fluids, 
So let's say we are talking about solids. And the solid here is my soft tissue. So you basically have to cut, cut me and take out the tissue. And let's fill it up. Or the other example can be silly putty, which is a lot easier. Right? So we fill up, fill up the gap between the two. Now, take super glue. Most of you probably have seen that commercial on the TV. So put a super glue here. Okay? And the super glue can lift a car. So obviously, it should, it should be helpful here. Okay, now hold the outer one fixed. Take a wrench or whatever you like and then fix it. So what will be the displacements on this boundary? Zero. Now, we need a strong person, King Kong. And the King Kong can rotate the inner one through 2 pi, 360 degrees. Either clockwise or counterclockwise makes no difference. So what will be the displacements on the inner surface? What is the displacement equal to? Final position minus initial position. So if I rotate through 360 degrees, and assuming my super glue is uh, very good, then what will be the displacements at points on the inner surface? Zero. Will the displacements at any point inside the body be zero? So what are my boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are displacements are zero at every point on the surface. And if I'm not happy with the two pi, I can ask my friend King Kong to rotate it by two n pi, where n is an integer. So what will be the displacements if, you, if that person rotates the inner rod through, say, 4 pi? Again, zero. So how many solutions should we expect for this problem? And we are assuming this rod really goes to infinity in the axial direction, so that we don't have to worry about what is happening at the bottom surface. Infinite. So we have infinitely many solutions to the same displacement value problem. Okay? <coughs> why, did, why, don't, why didn't you see it? But before I answer why didn't you see it, let's look at one more example. Okay, this one, you can do experiments. If I mean, this is experimentally, it has been experimentally validated. Oh, this one can, this is also experiment, right? You mean, you can take a, this experiment, fluid mechanics people do it all the time to find viscosity of the fluid. And if people who work in the paint industry, like say Dow Chemical or DuPont or paint, like Williams, whatever that paint, this wall paint, you can find whether this paint is good or bad by doing such kind of experiment. And if the paint is generally, it is not a viscous, it is not a Navier-Stokes fluid. It does not behave like a Navier-Stokes fluid. Let me ask you anyway. If it were a Navier-Stokes fluid, what will be the shape of this surface, this, this, this surface here? Flat, very good. If it is not a Navier-Stokes fluid, that top surface is not flat. Either the fluid will rise, like it will climb, or it will shrink, like it will go down. You will see either something like this, or something like the opposite one. And that says the fluid is, or the paint is non-Newtonian. Okay, now, let's do this experiment. And this has been done. So we are talking about, again, 1930 or so. So it's not, um, like, at least not 100 years old. So take a rubber, and these are, so take a rubber, piece of rubber, and this is a rectangular sheet. It needs a square sheet. Uh, 
And on this rubber sheet, you apply again dead loads. So this rubber, this is a square sheet. You are applying equal loads P on both edges. Either you can say the total load is P or the load per unit length is P or the load per unit area is P, but it's per unit area in the reference configuration, not per unit area in the present configuration. That makes a lot of difference. And some of the, this homework problem you are supposed to be doing it asks you to find or plot a stress tensor curve or find Cauchy stress tensor uh, and find the first Peulager curve stress tensor. So, so one is with respect to present area, the other is with respect to the undeformed area. Here we are talking about undeformed area. If you say deformed area, things don't work out the way I'm going to say now. Okay, so now what what will you expect for the stretch in the x and y direction? And this rubber, you can assume, is made of an incompressible material. Incompressible means what? The deformation is isochoric. Very good. So let's assume now that we apply equal loads per unit undeformed area on both, like in both x and y directions. So what will you expect for the stretch in x and y direction? Material is homogeneous, like it's made of the same, the same rubber everywhere. There are no inhomogeneities in the material. So what will you expect for the stretch? Stretch, you know, final length over initial length. So it will be same. So what happens is the following. If you do the experiment, and I don't do any physical experiments, but one of my colleagues did physical experiment. And also not only, yeah, I think one of my colleagues, that's a reasonable way to say it. One of my colleagues, he did the experiment, I think it's 2004 or three, something like that. So here is what happens. So if we plot lambda 1, which is a lambda x and lambda y, so that's stretch in the x direction and stretch in the y direction. And you, of course, when you start, both are 1. Stretch is never negative. Less than 1 means compression. More than 1 means tension. But there is no such thing as stretch equal to 0. So what, so initially, as you said, the stretches are equal. So if you had, if you had drawn a grid on it, like if you had drawn a square grid, each square is deformed uniformly. Like each square, supposing this is a uniform grid, then each square looks again a square. No, no, no sweat or no problem. However, at a certain load, which depends upon the material, of which depends upon the rubber. So this is this is a good example for people who are working in biomechanics, because our tissues are generally modeled as a rubber-like material. And if the surgeon keeps start stretching it on both directions, something like the following may happen. So the initially the stretches are equal. However, at a certain load, they become unequal. So lambda y is more than lambda x, or lambda x is more than lambda y. And the PS doesn't like it, but this is an experimental observation. Okay. If you give me the rubber, I can tell you when this will happen. You don't have to give me the size of this piece. 
All you need to give me is the material properties of the rubber, like the stress strain law for the rubber. It it does not happen in in every rubber. It happens in most rubbers. So it can happen in our tissues because we model them as a as a rubber-like material. So it can happen that if you are stretching, if you are applying equal loads in both directions to a square piece of rub membrane. Membrane means it's very thin in the thickness direction. Then, after a certain while, the two stretches become unequal. I cannot tell you whether lambda x will be more than lambda y or lambda y will be more than lambda x. None of us can tell you that. I mean, this is not, I cannot tell you. I mean, none of us who studies this kind of problem can tell us, can tell in advance. However, this you can see in experiments. Okay? So it's not something I am cooking up. What happens is, after a certain while, the configuration that has unequal stretches has lower potential energy than the one that has equal stretches. And all of our bodies, like everything in continuum mechanics, if it is in equilibrium, it has the lowest potential energy. So after a certain while, the configuration with the unequal stretches has a lower potential energy. Now, you have not seen this because all three example problems are four example problems I, I outlined. You have not seen them because, I mean, to you, this thing is either kind of magic or nonsense, one of the two, depending upon your point of view, we have not seen this because you do only small deformation tests. <coughs> if you do only strains of the order of 1%, I mean, this cannot happen. I mean, in going from this configuration to that configuration, the strain is not 1%. Okay? Same thing here. In going from this kind of configuration to that kind of configuration, strain cannot be 1%. If you rotate the inner rod by 360 degrees, you are not inducing strain of 1%. So in small deformation theory, all of these problems are gone. They disappear. They are, that's because you have already assumed that you are going to study small deformations. But the world is not based on small deformations. There are problems where the deformations can be large. And that tissue example, if you watch, I don't know, PBS or something, some TV show where they show you, where they show surgery being done, you can see the, the tissues being stretched, um, I don't know, probably 100%, 50, at least 100%. 100 is nothing. I mean, they just show stretching. We are talking about stretches of the order of like 10, 20, 30 which means you take a one centimeter length and make a 20 centimeter length. Of course, they, I mean, the surgeon can chop it off or cut it with a knife, but you can see those stretch, being stretched though. So, same thing here. This thing does not, this thing does not happen at, for small stretches. The stretches have to be large. <coughs> so if we are studying small deformations, what do we mean by small deformations? So what do we mean by small deformations? <coughs> so either we use the word small, or we can also use the word infinitesimal. So both of these mean the same thing. Either small or infinitesimal, they mean the same thing. OK? So. So what we mean by this is the following, that the displacement gradient, either with respect to little x or with respect to big x, this is the magnitude of these nine components, is of the order of epsilon, where epsilon is much, much less than 1, or epsilon square is negligible as compared to epsilon. <clears throat> I 
epsilon square is negligible as compared to epsilon. So we keep only first order terms in our equations. So if you have strains of the order of 1 or 2 percent, this is okay. Because if you have a strain of the order of 1 percent, then epsilon is 0.01. So epsilon square is 0 0.0001. And you can say, okay, 0 0.0001 is negligible as compared to 0 0.01. With these approximations, the life becomes very simple. In what way? Um, let's look at, say, F, the deformation gradient. So that will, of course, be 1 plus H, where H is the displacement gradient. H is delta U over delta big X. So it has nine components. And yes? Is that the identity matrix? Yeah, that is the identity matrix. Like it's, I was going to say that, but okay. it's like main, it's, it has one on the main diagonals and zero elsewhere. So we, so what do we, oh, before we go there, what about the determinant of F? If we have small deformations, then the determinant of F, which is the determinant of 1 plus H, that comes out to be scalar number one, like unit, plus H, trace of H. So H11 plus H22 plus H33. The other terms are higher order, like they are H square and H cube. So this is approximately equal to that. Which is the same, H11 is the same thing as E11, small strain, E11. So H11 is the same thing as small strain E11 plus E22 plus E33. And then you will see that the next line makes life simple because what is the relationship between the second polar, sorry, first polar curve stress tensor? and Cauchy stress tensor. So the first, uh, the first Piola-Grigov stress tensor is related to the Cauchy stress tensor by this relation. Now to compare quantities, everything should have the same units. So our F is non-dimensional because it's like centimeter per centimeter. So we are going to make our Cauchy stress T non-dimensional. So you divide it by Young's modulus. Okay. You divide it by Young's modulus, so it's a small number. You are not dividing by the maximum stress. T here is not of the order of one. T is of the order of epsilon. So if we do that, then this is 1 plus trace of E. This one is non-dimensional Cauchy stress. And this one is 1 minus, at least 1 plus H in inverse, then is transpose. Like F is 1 plus H. So F inverse will be 1 plus H inverse, then we take the transpose. Jessica? Is that U, T, thing? Oh, it's trace. Yeah. Trace? Yeah, trace, right. I think we, did we define trace? Yeah, just look funny for Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is trace, like TR. So what is this expression equal to? Well, if you, I think you have heard of the binomial theorem. You know how to expand 1 plus x raised to the power minus 1. If x is small, you can say Taylor series. But generally, we say binomial theorem. So it's 1 plus trace of E 
then this is a T. So binomial theorem says that this is 1 minus H plus H square. But H square is small as compared to H. So in the approximation we are doing, we can neglect H square. Right? Because we, we already neglected H square here. We neglected H square and H cube there. So if we neglected once, we can neglect again too. Otherwise, it will not be consistent. So, so we neglected. That's why I changed now. Instead of equal, I made it approximately equal. The next step is, I'm not doing anything. It's 1 plus trace of E, T. So this will be 1 minus H transpose. Because transpose, transpose of A plus B, like A plus B transpose is A transpose plus B transpose. And now multiply it out. So the first, if I multiply it, 1 times T gives me T. What about trace E times T? That's of the order epsilon squared now. Remember, T is of the order of epsilon. So trace E times T is of the order of epsilon squared, which we are neglecting. 1 minus H transpose. And if we multiply it further, this is equal to T. Because T multiplied with H transpose is of the order epsilon square. Which we are neglecting. So in the first order theory, which means linear linear theory or small deformation theory or infinitesimal deformations, first Kolaker Cobb stress tensor equals the Cauchy stress tensor. So that's why in your deforms class, mechanics of deforms class, we never said anything about whether it's per unit undeformed area or per unit deformed area because we were dealing with small strains. <coughs> okay? So in the small deformation theory, the, the everything matches up. So I got the signal, but just let's go for one more step. Maybe two, three more minutes, otherwise we will have to start tomorrow. So what about S? The the first, the second Pelagor Cobb stress tensor. So the second Pelagor Cobb stress tensor is F inverse T tilde. F inverse we just saw is identity minus H by this. Again, binomial theorem approximation. We are neglecting H square. And this is equal to T tilde, which is equal to T. <coughs> so, so S equal to T tilde equal to T. So all three stress tensors basically collapse into one. It's because the changes in, because the strains are small. The changes in areas are small. So if the strain is like say one percent, the change the change in area going is going to be how much? If the strain is of the order of one percent, which means 0 0.01, what will be the change in the area? It will be epsilon square because what, to find the change in the area, you have to multiply two dimensions, right? So, and we are already saying we are neglecting terms of the order of epsilon square. So, by the same reasoning, this heat flux Q 
which is per unit undeformed area equals in this case heat flux Q per unit deformed area. <coughs> so in small deformation theory you don't have to say I'm applying loads per unit undeformed area or per unit deformed area. Small deformation, small, small, so that's the key word. Now rubber is most of the time if you deform rubber like materials the deformations are not small. If you blow up your tank, deformations are not small. If there's an earthquake of magnitude, say, 6.6 .6 or above, the deformations may not be small. If there's a hurricane having winds of the order of like 100, meter, 100 miles per hour or a tornado, I mean, tornado, hey, come on, that can lift the whole building and put it in the air. So how can the deformation be small? Right? I mean, we have seen on the TV, I mean, a tornado, when a tornado comes, it just takes the car and whirls it around up in the air. Buildings, um, they just, it's very deadly. So you cannot say I'm going to use small deformation theory and, and predict something. So what we are studying applies to both, large deformations as well as small deformations. The life becomes much easier in small deformations as we will see in a week or so that the equations we have to solve are linear. But in large deformation theory, the equations are nonlinear. And of course, when you go from nonlinear to linear, you miss, you miss very inter some of the very interesting phenomena. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So now we have made up at least three classes.